This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And Doc, as you know, one of our fine partners at the DSP Network is The Athletic, which is premium, premium, premium coverage for passionate Detroit sports fans. And listeners of this very episode of Two Bad Hombres can get 20% off the first year of an annual subscription to The Athletic by visiting theathletic.com slash DSP. I was trying to get an eyelid. I want them dead presidents. I want to pull up. Head spin. Get it, get flat. I got six jobs. I don't get it. We are still, still, still not tired on this week's episode of Two Bad Hombres. I am your host, Vito Geronimo Trick, along to my usual psychic and broadcast partner and fun. That is Doc from Doc and Jack, John Charles Macaroon. John, how are you doing? Vito, I'm on top of the world, brother. We you just should had feel like it. an amazing week on the podcast. The Detroit Sports Podcast Network took another step forward, and that's all you can do is just continue to build up accomplishments, feeling successful. Why am I so happy? Why am I so giddy? The week of podcast was amazing in terms of downloads, subscribers on iTunes, engagement on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast, and obviously the cherry on top of my cake was sitting on Monday night knowing that something that me and you were part of over a year ago, literally we taped it May 7th because I got the pictures and what's great on a phone is you can look back and see when you took certain photos. So I look back and I had a feeling, okay, they said spring, so they didn't air it after, you know, me and Vito were part of an A&E special with George Lopez and we didn't know when they were going to air it. So throughout the course of the last year, periodically I check in, people would ask, you know, you kept hyping up that you were part of this project. You took photos with George Lopez. You kept blowing up Vito, showing that he was part of it. All the signs that we made. All of a sudden I saw a commercial last Friday and I said, wait a minute. I, I went to A&E and I saw the schedule and I saw that it said A&E, very superstitious sports. And I said, Vito, we're on baby. I texted you right away and you could sense that I was like, yes. And so Monday night, it's very fun. I can't wait to get your sense of how you experienced it, but I'm sitting down with the wife and I'm like, look, honey, it's going to air, I think. But I went into it with no expectations. I literally told myself, dude, you're getting cut. Just go into it. But I was nervous watching it. And the fun part was we didn't get shown till the very end of the program. So I was a little bit kind of hopeful. So I told my mom, who's vacationing in Chicago with another relative, I said, Mom, if you're, you know, it's 930 Central, if you have a chance to watch it, I think I'm on it. So she sat with my cousin and his kids, and, you know, the first segment was about boxing and superstitions. The second segment was about baseball, and then they went to the Detroit side. So the first opportunity was, are they going to air my call? Because I was one of those callers, darn it. They took, uh, they cut that part out, and I know in television they air and film a lot, and they cut a lot to fit in a half an hour special. And I was a little disappointed that we didn't get the entire half hour. I, I felt bad for those that got interviewed by George Lopez and, and didn't make it on television. We were part of the filming of The Exorcism to end the curse of Bobby Lane. And then they showed the, the preview of the church scene before the final segment. You and I were in it. You see my big bald head. You see me and you cheering. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> I saw Vito. I'm like, I texted you right away. I'm like, uh, you did. Sucker, oh, we you were all over it. I love the part too, really quick, not to you know interject and interrupt here, yeah. but you know what? You were jumping up for that banner. I saw yes. you had to jump up. Yes. <laughs> You're the only guy jumping up. Yeah, exactly. The ball had to do, short ball had to do. Yes. It's the doc. Oh, it was John. He was jumping up to try to reach the banner, get a little piece of it. That was hilarious. I think my mom and I were both watching it together at that point. We were cracking up because we knew that was you. It was like, you're jumping up. The only guy jumping up, man. Exactly. <laughs> That's the reaction that my family had was, they were like, bro, you were really into the ceremony because I was clapping. Yeah. I was into it. They were like, um, you know, and, and Middle Eastern people are great. Bless their hearts. You know, 15 minutes in, they're like, where are you? You're like, nothing yet. I'm like, dude. You know, they add that little bit of poking like, you know, oh, my God, I can have my family sitting there and it's not going to air. It's embarrassing because I really wanted to. You know me, Vito. I wanted to have a fucking watch party. Oh, you I wanted, wanted to, to advertise it to everybody in your neighborhood. Yes, I know you. Yes. I wanted to be like, dude, this is amazing. Yes. You know, because I get excited. That's what it's about. That's why you do these things to have that fun. But it's really ridiculous because if you're part of that production, you could have at least emailed me and said, yes, you're in it. Hype it up. You're in it. I emailed the producer and said, look, it's been a minute. 
Where's the, you know... Am you I, did, actually? I you emailed producer, somebody about this, I emailed, really? I emailed the contact person and said, look, I you know don't want to know all about it, but am I in it so I can hype it up? No response back. So it's silly because I have a following. Well, I, I guess, guess they anyway. couldn't tell you, though. They probably couldn't tell you because they were still maybe editing stuff. No, they, they, they've had to have seen it because it, it was hyped up and things like that. But here's the thing that made it fun was when the final segment aired in the church scene, I'm in it a lot. You're in it a lot. You're holding up the sign. We're fist pumping each other. And uh, about the lions, how sad are li- we? Hey, listen, about the sad old lions. I don't care. It was fun. That was the whole purpose. Was we got to do our part to end the curse. And it did kind of feel like the way I really like the pastor. My God, the drama and the way he said it. Like the curse has been in here in the city, and it may never be lifted. But we're gonna try. And I was like, man. We got to maybe get that pastor back on because that was cool. He uh, he made it fun, and as what everybody told me was like, "Damn, bro, you were really into it." And I you was really like, believe in uh, superstitions? Do you actually, or was that kind of some fake pride and excitement that you showcased? I am superstitious. No, I so am. You are legitimately superstitious. Where you believe that there is a curse? No, I'm superstitious in the realm of. I like uh, good luck charms and things like that to avoid bad luck. So I have a couple of things that I keep in my pocket, uh, rosaries on the religious side. And I have a bag of like chips, uh, casino money chips and things like that that kind of make me feel good if I'm playing. And little gadgets here and there for good luck. As you can see, I kind of surround myself with things that visually make me happy in the world of sports and things like that. But uh, I'm not... Uh, superstitious in the terms of like you know don't jump over lines or things like that. I'm more uh, superstitious in the lines of I like things that make me feel good that bring me good luck. Good luck charms. I'm a good luck charms guy. So so you wear the same pair of underwear for like two <laughs> weeks straight for a month straight. If the lions get on a roll and, and uh, things like that, I I'll do the same thing. Keep similar routines. I won't wear the same underwear. That's that's gross. Like George Lopez said. I mean, now yeah, you're probably was joking, but it was funny. He's a comedian. He did have some humor, and there was one part too that I just started cracking up. I shouldn't have started cracking up. But I think my mom was too. The silver hair and the uh, losing to the Raiders. Well, no, not about George, but during the lion ceremony. That Lions fan, all dressed the up, blues. like the most passionate and he was dude, crying. crying. I was laughing. I couldn't hold it back. I was laughing at the guy. I'm like, you're crying over this? <laughs> Not to be offensive, you know, or poke fun at him, but really, you're crying over this ceremony? It made you cry? What Come your, on, man. How did you and your family experience it uh, throughout the day? Because I texted you last Friday. I'm oh, like, you were the up. one that was all enthused and texting everybody, posting on Facebook. I didn't even tell anybody about it until, like, last minute, last night, on Monday night of this past week. That it was airing, Why? and my mom watched it. Well, this how this tells you how excited the rest of my family was. My dad was in bed, snoring. My brother was in his room. He went in his room, said, forget you, I'm not watching this. And I'll say this much. I'll embarrass myself here a little bit, too, and showcase how I really wasn't too, too excited. I fell asleep at some point during the episode. My brother had to wake me up. He woke me up to watch the rest of it. Luckily, I only had, like, missed some of it, like two minutes of it, and we were halfway into that episode, the sports episode that we were featured in. So I saw the remainder of it, which featured us in the church with the ceremony for the Lions. So luckily, I saw what I wanted to when you and I were actually on TV during that episode. What did you think of when you were holding up the sign? They have you holding both signs, the green one here, which I have, the Detroit logo. We still have it in the studio. Yep. Trust me, that's, not, that's never being thrown out. Exactly. So. So that got featured. You, you and I were both holding it. The best one, though, was obviously for me. They featured me kind of. They zoomed in on me a couple times. And one where they kind of zoomed across and you're holding the sign up and things like that. So it was fun. So when your mom saw you, she was like, oh, my God, that's really kind of cool. What would you we say? We were, I think, just laughing because you could see me clapping. You're clapping. You're jumping up. You're yelling. We're yelling, man. I mean, we really, we legitimately got into it. We were screaming. I think our voices were gone by the end of the night, and we got to meet George Lopez. We took photos with them. I still have that photo. You posted it again, reshared it. I mean, you were just loving the the limelight that we got for you and I, and it was great. You, you know, you showered me with some love as well and affection for being a part of the episode with you. Before we talk to our featured guest of this week's Too Bad Hombre, Steve Dace from the Michigan Podcast, he's got a lot to say about the draft, and a guy like that you always give time to when he's like, look, i got to break it down. I want to get on the air. I like guys like that that just want to say, look, I, I have a reaction to the draft. I want to talk about it. He wants us to also talk about Pro Football Focus and the way they framed the narrative regarding the draft. We'll talk to Steve in about five minutes, but in the end, was my reaction over the top? Because I... I do feel like sometimes it's like some people were like, hey, look, you just do the project, keep it moving on to the next thing. But I'm an emotional guy. I get excited because it's just I look at it from the big picture in the course of the podcast. I'm obviously trying to get attention for the podcast, trying to convince people that it's just not 
another way of just broadcasting like all the other 500 that do it. I've taken it to a level that's really kind of productive and professional and allow people that are interested like you and Steve and Jerry and Jason and Adam to have an opportunity to grow and network and market and get an audience. And so for me, it's fulfilled all the goals because I look at it from like, wow, five years ago, September 2013, me and my boy Kenny turn on a computer, hit the button, and he records. He's the first voice on the network. And now to look at it, you and I are representing DSP and going out there and we were basically... And we were invited because we were Where part of- Where the hell was that church, too? In the middle of nowhere, we went out to it. I mean, you dragged me out. I was willing to do it. I bet Adam, Jason, everybody else that you asked, you asked before me, weren't willing to go out there to be supportive of you and your endeavors there. But you're in it to win it. You're in it for the long haul. You're totally invested. When you invest in something, you're totally invested, aren't you? And that's what you were showcasing. And maybe you exuded over-the-top excitement, but you really loved genuinely being there in that moment, living it up, being there with George Lopez and trying to break the curse of Bobby Lane. I mean, the Lions haven't won a championship, guys, since 1957. We're trying to break the curse, and we were actively a part of it. We got into it. We were actively engaged, man. I mean, you went up there, and you, you wrote a letter, and you spoke from the heart. Well, you you spoke at the podium. I mean, you, you spoke up there at the altar of the church and gave your best rendition of what, what what the lines have meant to you, why this curse has to be broken, how it can be, all of the above. I mean, you got into it. You bought into it. And the thing is, if you're going to start doing something, you should buy into it fully. And really, you have. Since September of 2013, you have fully bought into it. And that's why this podcast network has risen to the heights that it has. And now we just have to keep growing and growing it. And maybe, you know being a part of more and more events like we were with Georgia Lopez on that, what, Thursday night in a random church. Don't know where the hell I went once again, but man, it was well worth it. And we had a bunch of laughs too that we shared with, with all those people that came, not a ton, but a good amount that crowded the church. And maybe we actually broke the curse of Bobby Lane. That's maybe it. it'll come to fruition. And then we can say, we did it. We'll compliment ourselves. If they win a championship anytime soon, next season or two, three, four, five years down the line, we can say it's all because of us, Doc and Vito at the DSP Network. Good stuff, man. All right, let's get to Steve Dace. He's definitely excited to talk about the NFL draft, talk about the Lions. Man, what a great recap of that. Um, I'll definitely find it and try to post it, the full episode, or at least the last segment. because Or go to my that Facebook page. That was the most page. important part, the yeah, last segment, because we yeah, were in it. I mean, yeah, exactly. if it wasn't for us being in it, I bet that, that show wouldn't have rated at all with anybody watching. But anyways. Host of the Michigan podcast that airs here on the DSP Network, Steve Dace. Let's dial him up. Steve Dace from the Michigan Podcast now joining us for some fresh feedback. Steve, how are you doing? I'm well, guys. How are you doing? Great to have you on. I think we're doing well, and uh, we're doing well because the Lions, I think, did well in the draft, too, overall-wise. And I, I was excited about what they did in the first round, the second round, the fifth round. And I'm talking about those draft picks specifically because they short up the O-line. They keep building the offensive lineup, and they got a running back from Auburn and Carrion Johnson, who I really like as well. And I like the value getting him in the second round. What do you have to say about those picks specifically and what they did to continue building up the offensive line and to keep improving the ground game, which really started with adding LeGarrette Blunt in the offseason? Well, what I said, you know, I want to continue with the theme the last time you guys had me on is, you know, I've been a Long Lions fan for uh, 35 years now, and it has, it can make me as bitter and cynical on game day as anybody else. You follow my Twitter feed on game day. I, I, you know, I, I kind of coined my own little nickname for them, the lie, L I E uh, dash ins. Okay. So I get the cynicism, but I go back to what I said the last time I was on as well which is really, I think, for the first time. You know, the Lions have had some talented teams. Um, you know, when I was in high school, in college, Barry Sanders, Herman Moore, Lomas Brown, Kenny Glover, Chris Spielman, Benny Blades, Brett Perriman. I mean, these guys were all Pro Bowl players. They've had talented teams every now and then. But you never really got the sense that they had a plan. And, and I think, really, for the first time in the 35 years I've been a fan, you can see that they have a plan. And if you look at the way NFL teams are built – uh, dominant teams are. You, need, you start with your franchise quarterback. They already had that. And that's why, I, that's why I think when you compare Matt Patricia to the other pro football flameouts of head coaches of, of the Bill Belichick tree, 
keep in mind, I, I went back and looked at every single one of those Belichick uh, protégés that went to the NFL, and the best quarterback any of them had was Eric Mangini had Chad Pennington for a couple of years. So Patricia's walking in uh, to a situation with a guy that I think has played at a Hall of Fame level at the last couple of years, and his career is now at its peak. Uh, so he's got the franchise quarterback. So then phase two is you build from the inside out. And the way that looks in the NFL is – uh, you have to be able you win games consistently if you can do two things. One is if you can protect your quarterback, and the other is if you can pressure the other team's quarterback. Now, it is much easier to manufacture pressure with different schemes and exotics uh, and multiple looks, and that's sort of Matt Patricia's forte. It's much easier to do that to do that than to scheme pass pro. You either have the horses up front or you don't. And uh, you can see this was, I think, the weakest pass rush draft I can ever remember. I I, I didn't get the Ziggy Ansah comparisons to Marcus Davenport other than, you know, I guess they kind of look the same. But, you know, when Ziggy Ansah went down to the Senior Bowl five years ago, he dominated all week long. He just dominated. It. Nobody could block him. Marcus Davenport went down there and made Isaiah win a first-round draft pick for Georgia. I mean, he got dominated. He got exposed. So, I, I mean, if he's the second-best pass rusher next to Bradley Chubb, who's legit, I think that gives you an idea that this was not a great pass rush draft. Now, next year's draft, it's going to be one of the best. It's going to be the, the 1983 quarterback draft for pass rushers next year. But this year was weak. And so you saw the Lions say, you know what? Uh, one way to help your defense uh, is you control the clock. You actually convert more third and shorts. You actually convert more red zone uh, scoring opportunities into touchdowns. And if they do that in two games last year, um, you know, they're 11 and five and uh, they're playing in the playoffs. And those two losses where they were unable to do that, I go back to Atlanta and I go back to Pittsburgh at home, change those two games around, and, and we have a totally different feel of this season. Probably Jim Caldwell is still the coach. They're going to fire a guy for going 11-5. and five. And so that's the margin for error, guys, in the NFL. And when you look at what the Lions did in this draft, I think they addressed it very well. Uh, Pro Football Focus says Frank Ragnow is the number one center prospect they have ever evaluated going back to 2006. I've been saying since December, since the regular season of college football ended, I thought Carry on Johnson was a perfect fit for the Lions offense. He's an Arian Foster kind of running back, a glider, a guy who can catch the ball down the field. Because here's the thing, and this is why I didn't think Darius Geis was a great fit for the Lions. Darius Geis is a downhill runner, and, and forget all the, the stuff that's come out about him and his attitude and you know fights with assistant coaches in Philadelphia. Just table all that for a second. He's an eye formation, downhill runner, like a, he's a, a, like a Leonard Fournette, his predecessor at LSU, you have to commit to getting him the ball 20 to 25 times. When you have Matthew Stafford in the prime of his career, you don't want to have to commit to that. You, you want to run the ball better, not more. There's a difference between running it more and running it better. And what the Lions are doing now, guys, with their running game is, based on what the personnel grouping is, you know 90% of the time if it's a run or a pass, based on whether Theo Riddick is in the game. And Kerryon Johnson is more of – a physical version doesn't have doesn't have the the lateral explosion of a Reggie Bush, but he ha, but he has a, but in terms of a of a varied skill set, um, you know he was the he was the lightning in the thunder and lightning backfield for Auburn a couple of years ago uh, when they had another big fella back there. Then that guy got hurt and he had to carry the whole load this year. And you saw him just dominate the SEC. He was SEC Offensive Player of the Year, and I think he's a perfect fit for the Lions. The only pick I didn't understand. And I go down, you look at Deshaun Hand. Deshaun Hand's a guy that can play every position on the Lions' defensive front. So he's basically a backup for every one of Matt Patricia's uh, defensive line spots. I love the pick of Tyrell Crosby in the fifth round. Daniel Jeremiah at the NFL Network thought he was a top 50 overall prospect. He was voted by defenders in the Pac-12, the number one offensive lineman in that league last year. Uh, so I liked everything they did, except I didn't understand the third-round pick to me. You've got to get a guy that you know is going to start in that third round when you only go in with six draft picks. Uh, I, I have a hard time believing uh, a guy who was third team all Sun Belt. Uh, there wasn't somebody who could more immediately contribute to the team there. But I will add this. Adam Schefter at ESPN said his sources told him that if the Lions had not taken Tracy Walker there, he was going about three picks later. So overall, I thought you know the number one target of this offseason for me was once and for all address the running game. And they have tried to do that. And now we will sit back and see whether they chose the right pieces to do it with or not.
Now, Steve, I know you're a fan of pro football focus. You had concerns, though, regarding the way they framed the Detroit Lions draft, calling it below average when they compared and they had a similar score to other teams. Now, my thinking would be that they maybe valued the importance of the Lions picks when you have a new head coach and when you're looking at potentially shoring up the offense, they maybe felt like, well, you have Matt Patricia and you have a glaring need maybe along the defensive line. And so when you take the perspective of, hey, did you address that need? Maybe not. And in terms of importance, maybe when you have a couple question marks, that's why maybe they graded their draft below average when they have similar scores to organizations like the Steelers or like organizations that have maybe better talent going into it. They may not need as big a score to rate as high, but you had some concerns about pro football focus and with those that titled the draft for the Lions below average. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I want to say this. I love pro football focus. They do excellent work. They've been doing it since 2006. And for our listeners that aren't aware of who they are, they're, they're basically current and former scouts that created this website, and they just break down every college and NFL players every single snap for an entire season. And individual scouts look at individual conferences and divisions. And then what happens at the end of the year is they rotate them just to get a second look. So, you know, myopia can set in. A guy can fall in love with a player or, or the other way around. So that being said, I'm a huge fan of their work. And I love analytics because I like objective reality. We live in this era now where every time someone offends me, you're wrong. Uh, anything that doesn't comport to my preferred narrative must be fake news. Tell me what is the objective truth, and then I can adjust to it from there. So I, that's my disclaimer. I love the work they do, but it made no sense to me when their composite rating for Lions, the Detroit Lions draft picks was 82.3, and they said they had a below-average draft. Well, that's higher than what the Steelers had per draft pick, and they had an average draft, according to P, P, PFF. And then PFF said that the, the Tennessee Titans had – uh, had a had a good draft, and their point uh, per per draft pick was one tenth of a point higher than Detroit's. So you could be right, and and they're looking at that pass rush position. But you know, you go back, and you know, we were all on Twitter together on draft night. I should have drafted this guy, and and you know, I had several guys on my board higher than Frank Rag now too. And guess what? Nobody picked those guys the rest of the night when the Lions didn't pick them either. So I guess we could all sit by here and Detroit Lions Twitter. We can all claim we know more than Bill Belichick does. Good luck with that, I guess. I mean, the Patriots picked twice after after Bob Quinn did, and they didn't pick any of the guys that we wanted the Lions to pick instead of Frank Ragnow. There really wasn't a pass rusher there in the first round. There really wasn't a pass rusher there in the second round. I mean, it, it, I think the Browns made a huge mistake passing on the opportunity to pair Bradley Chubb with Miles Garrett because in today's NFL corners don't have the value they used to have anyway because man if you grab a hair follicle it's uh, you know it's illegal touching five yards automatic first down you, you want the pass rusher instead so i i don't know who else they could have picked there that would have changed those things uh they're, they're they were never really in a position with where they got carry on johnson you know we have three running backs go in the first round that's one or two more than a lot of people were forecasting we started off the second round and two of them went right away so the Lions are sitting there saying, we cannot sit here and, and have the board dictated to us and have all of our first-tier backs are gone. I mean, if you want to you talk about killing the franchise, guys, if all of those top-tier running backs would have been gone and the Lions go with a guy like Kalen Balaj, who could never start at Arizona State and had two good practices at the Senior Bowl, we would be absolutely and justifiably killing them right now, right? So I, I don't know what else they could have done with the way that the board worked out. There is no perfect team. You can't address every single need at all times. They had two glaring needs in this draft and only six picks. And one of them was the running game and the other one was the pass rush. And I think they smartly chose to go with utilizing the majority of those picks for the, for the, for the, for the running game where there was a lot more margin for error and a lot deeper talent pool. And then you sit back, you know, we just hired a rocket scientist, right? That's our new head coach. And as I said a few minutes ago, it is easier to scheme up a pass rush than it is pass pro. So let's sit back and see when uh, with the guy over there with the pencil in his ears, he's rubbing his beard like he's Albert Einstein. You know, let, let's see what he can concoct to put some pressure on a quarterback. Because most NFL games now, if you watch the Patriots, this is the way they played in the Matt Patricia, Bill Belichick era. They know they have a Hall of Fame quarterback. Most 90 some odd percent of NFL games these days are decided by one possession, eight points or less. So if you look at the way the Patriots have played over the last few years with, with Tom Brady, uh, they know 
hey, don't give up a bunch of big plays. Don't get buried early on. Uh, force teams to go the length of the field. You have, you're going to have the better quarterback almost every single Sunday. And therefore, you need, to, you need to have a defense that gets into the red zone, holds teams to field goals, and makes that one stop that allows your Hall of Fame quarterback to either win the game at the end or grind the game out at the end. And I think you will see the Lions play very similar with Matt Patricia, with Matt Stafford, who's not as great as Tom Brady, but the last couple of years, whatever that tier below Brady and Aaron Rodgers is, he's in that next tier, and they can play a similar way. And that's why when I was a, when you evaluate the Lions' schedule, and this is why I said if they're not at least 10-6 and six and Stafford is healthy, fire everybody, go up and down their schedule of 16 weeks and tell me right now, outside of the game against New England, which you're getting them at home, and the two games against New England, or I'm sorry, against Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, presuming he's healthy. Tell me, the, the, tell me who has a better quarterback than the Lions do in the other 13 games, because I don't think you can tell me that. So, I mean, Steve, with the Lions offseason, how well they drafted, it looks like. Are they NFC North division title contenders now? I don't know. Um, you know, what's interesting is I still think, I, I, I didn't think they did enough in free agency. I think that's where there should be some criticism now. The free agent pool went insane. Uh, it was one of the weaker free agent pools I can imagine, I, I, I can remember. And then that ha- guys were getting way, way overpaid. And so I can see where Bob Quinn coming from the New England uh, system was like, yeah, homie, don't play that. But I, I think there was probably one or two guys there uh, that if we went back and looked at some free agent signings that they could have. I mean, look at the Vikings are getting Sheldon Richardson essentially on a one year gimme tryout uh, for a chance to build himself uh, for you know another year to be a free agent again. That's a, a kind of potential difference maker. I would have liked to have seen the Lions looking ahead to the draft and realizing it was a weak pass rush draft. And, and, and the Lions saying, you know what, we're going to focus on building the burning game in the draft. Let's try to get a couple of guys in here uh, and, and see if we can bum up or beef up the pass rush. I think that's where there's a better criticism. I think their overall roster is better than New England's. Uh, I'm sorry, better than Green Bay's. Uh, obviously, I put Aaron Rodgers ahead of Matt Stafford, but I think the gap between those two players has closed. The Vikings could potentially, if the Eagles don't have the best ro- best roster, the Vikings probably do. And then you throw in a guy who I think is overrated, but still really good. And what I mean overrated, he's not the best, most highest paid player in the NFL. But it's a deal the Vikings had to make for Kirk Cousins, and I applaud him for having the balls to make it. Because, you know, windows close fast. You don't have four or five years to win Super Bowls anymore unless you have, you know, an all-time run like the Patriots. You know, every year in the NFL, there's five new playoff teams. So the Vikings looked at their roster and realized, you know, a lot of these guys, we can't re-sign in two or three years because of the cap. And so let's go out and overpay Kirk Cousins right now and go for broke and put our chips into the table and go all in. And so I applaud them for that. I think they clearly have a better roster than Detroit's. So I don't don't think Detroit, unless something happens to Cousins, is a division uh, contender. I do think when you look across the rest of the NFC, I think the Rams clearly have a better roster uh, than Detroit does. But then after that, after the Rams, after the Vikings, I, I don't know that you look at too many teams, the NFC, and you say, well, they're just, you know, a man one to 22. They're a lot better than the Lions. I don't think that. Steve Dace, kind enough to give us a few minutes here on Two Bad Hombres. Definitely check out Steve and his great takes. I mean, not average takes, great takes daily at his Twitter page, Michigan Podcast. It's a good follow. Trust me. Now, we would be remiss if we didn't ask, what does it mean that Michigan got their guy and he's now eligible? Shea Patterson, earlier in the week, was ruled eligible, will likely be the man behind center for the Michigan Wolverines. It seems like there's been a level of excitement, um, kind of puffing out the chest for Wolverine fans. What does it mean, Shea Patterson, eligible for the Michigan Wolverines? I think think it means no excuses. I mean, we're talking about a guy, you know, Walter Camp Football is a website run by a a couple of former NFL scouts that I'm a huge fan of. I've read it for years. They've got him right now projected the number one pick in the 2019 draft. I've seen four other early mock drafts that all have Shea Patterson going in the first round. So you're telling me you're going to take a defense that was number three in the nation overall last year and returns nine starters. And then you look at you look at the way they've recruited at this those skill positions, and now we're going to add a guy who could be a first round draft pick at quarterback next year. Anybody who says it doesn't matter, it won't make a big difference. That, that's that's not even a hot take. You you you're just either a hater, a douchebag, or dumb, all, all, or all of the above. I mean, the idea that you would take a defense that's that loaded and add a first round draft pick quarterback to it and nothing improves is nuts. Now, that doesn't mean instantly 
they go they turn right around and go to East Lansing and win. They turn right around and go to Columbus and win. They turn right around and go to South Bend and win. I mean, that's, that doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is the opportunity, the likelihood they can do it in one or all of those spots is much higher. And if you go into a game in college football, at any level of football, really, and you can say you have the better quarterback and the better defense, you're going to win like 99% of the time. And when you look up and down Michigan's schedule, you know, maybe, maybe Brandon Peters improves. What worries me about him, guys, is – he took that after he was really developing. He took that shot in the mouth against Wisconsin, and then he came back in that Outback Bowl and looked like he wanted to be anywhere else on planet Earth other than playing football. Okay, I'm worried about that. You know, I, I, I wonder if he got the Chuck Knob locks there. Just don't get hit like that in high school, and, and you wonder where his development is at. McCaffrey, Joe Milton, we haven't seen anything from them. Those are young guys. You don't want to have to play them yet, and so that's why I think this was key. And when you look at Michigan's schedule now with Shea, without Shea, you could have said there were three or four teams on Michigan's schedule that you think had the better quarterback and better defense going in. And now when you look at Michigan's schedule, I'm not saying that, on every, that they have the better quarterback and better defense in every game, but what I am saying is you can make an argument that they're at least as good as all the best teams on their schedule at that position. And so now it's time for Jim Harbaugh to put that ship on his shoulder. He's been here before. You know, he got his arm broken on the 84 team that went six and six. That's the last time Michigan had to start three quarterbacks. And the next off season, I remember that as a kid, bought all the preseason magazines, Bo Schembechler's done, Michigan's over, games passed Bo by, the schedule's too tough. Notre Dame was a top 20 team. Maryland was a top 10 team. South Carolina was a top 20 team. That was our non-conference schedule. And then Illinois was a top 20 team. Michigan State had this Lorenzo White guy that was going to make them much better. Ohio State was a top 10 team. Iowa was a top five team. That was our conference schedule. And everybody said Michigan will be lucky to get to a bowl game. Well, that team ended up with, with all of those defensive guys coming back and a difference maker at quarterback returning uh, in Harbaugh. That team ended up 10-1-1 and and number two in the country. And so Jim has lived through this before, and I think he now needs to get some of the swagger back that he lost last year uh, with the way that the team just didn't develop the way that he wanted to. And I'm, I am, for the first time since the, since the debacle in Tampa, I'm actually optimistic about this coming season. And that's what we'll leave you with, Steve. Be optimistic. I can't wait. Watch the video either today or tomorrow. I posted a a video I'm going to post of my reaction as you were speaking. I'm a state guy, obviously. So I love the fact that you were projecting him as a number one pick and things like that. So it'll be fun. Watch the reaction. It'll be fun. But as always, (laughs) as a Michigan State supporter, we give equal time to those that want to discuss Michigan football. And I thank you so much for the conversation, a great talk about football, and Michigan will definitely have it again as the offseason progresses for both organizations, Lions and Michigan football. Vito and I, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Two Bad Hombres. Thanks, guys. Again, that was Steve. I can't wait to post that video, Vito. That's kind of funny as a state guy, but hey, we give equal time. And remember, for those that say, oh, you know, you guys are Michigan State focused. No, it's equal here at the podcast. There are basically four full-time hosts, and two of them support Michigan, two of them support Michigan State, and now Steve is the tiebreaker that sways it towards Michigan. More U of M heavy More coverage, U of but M we're not coverage. biased. I'm not even biased. You know, I'm a Michigan guy in terms of going to the games. I have the valiant Mason blue jacket, but really, I'm not a hardcore U of M guy at the end of the day. Sorry. Well, Sorry about that, Doc. Well, okay, Vito. It's nobody, the truth. I think it's the truth, Nobody's going to believe it because every so often... To hype you up as a Michigan guy, you have a jacket with a block M on it. Nobody and not that I wear it, I don't wear it everywhere that I go. You should really quick. This upcoming season, it is so well huge. What happens that first week? I think September first at Notre Dame under the lights at ND, and then it's not. You know what that song? It's all about Dre. Or you've heard about that, right? It's all about Dre. It's all about Shea. Not all about Dre, baby. It's all about Shea in Ann Arbor this season. He's got to get it done, man. And if he doesn't, this U of M football team might fail, maybe not as hugely as it did last year, but I think it could underachieve. And if that happens, what does Jim Harbaugh look like at the end of next season? If they fail to win more than eight games, if they fail to win 10 games, Doc, think about what the U of M faithful will be thinking about Jim Harbaugh after next season. Yeah, you and Steve both said it. No more excuses. It's go time. It's results time. 
So let's take our first time out. We'll come back. Second half of the podcast, some things that we got to discuss locally and nationally regarding, you know, a correspondence dinner that maybe went astray and obviously some things affecting Metro Detroiters when a major highway closes and things like that. So stay with us. You're listening to Two Bad Hombres on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Vito, I want to tell you about our host site, Potomatic.com. When Adam and I first started this project, we were looking for a great place to host all of our recorded audio. And up until this point, we've recorded eight to 900 weekly podcasts. Why do we use Podomatic? We can generate quality links super fast. We can invite great guests onto our podcast, and when they're done, we can give them a great link and say, hey, share this with your friends and family. That's how we grew the network. So if you're looking to start a brand new podcast, and why not? It's a great medium. It's a great way to storytell. It's a great way, if you're a fan of sports, to hang with your fellas and have some sports conversations. Interview those that are in the know in the world of Detroit sports or sports in general. If you're looking to start a brand new podcast, Doc and Jock, Vito, Jason, Steve, Jerry, all the hosts affiliated with the network, we're going to recommend one host site, one host site alone. Check out Podomatic.com. And I want to take this moment to laugh at myself really quick. I said there was a song like All About Dre or some lyrics from a song. It's Forgot About Dre. Uh-huh. Eminem and Dr. Dre forgot about Dre. But I'm going to tell you this much. Really quick, once again, Michigan will not be forgetting about Shea Patterson unless he stinks up the joint. Hmm. So if they have to forget about Shea Patterson this season in Ann Arbor, it's a big-time catastrophe on their hands. I'll just leave it at that. And there was maybe a mini-catastrophe at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, at least according to some pundits out there that well that were there, attended the event, or that watched it live, heard about it the next day, saw it on Twitter, what was said from Michelle Wolf. She was the MC, the comedian that took the podium, had the mic, did all the jokes, and some of it supposedly was a little bit too harsh of, well, the looks of like Sarah Sanders and Kellyanne Conway. Now, Vito... Very interesting to talk about this because it's made news, and one of the things that we want to do on the podcast is just kind of break down and uh, discuss the big news of the day socially in the world of entertainment and sports. And so when I heard this, I go, okay, what is the Correspondence Dinner? Because every time someone goes up there, you have the likes of a Seth Meyers. You have comedians go up there, and the intended purpose is to roast those politicians and not to take anybody seriously in the room because they're all present. You know, obviously some jokes have been made about Obama, his wife, uh, other politicians and things like that. That is the purpose. So when you have a comedian and you have somebody roasting you, you're going to take some heat. That's what a roast is, is not like, oh, let's go surface. No, we hit you hard in the paint. So they know it. And so when you go into it with that intended purpose, I feel like it's a bunch of noise about nothing. Oh my gosh. And so... It goes to show you, if you want to make anything political, any hour of podcasting that we've done, Vito, in the 900 shows we've put out in five years, you could break down something we've said and gone, oh my God, you guys are offensive, you guys are ridiculous, take you off the air, Vito shouldn't be representing any brands, things like that, with anything. But in the name of comedy and entertainment, look, the part that I would say was she failed not because of what she said. I didn't think it was funny. I listened to every version of what was released. I didn't laugh. I didn't think it was that funny. And the other part that I kept saying was, man, what's the most important thing about communication? How you sound. And I think everybody here on the network has a decent sounding voice that at least can project with some editing and things like that. Her voice. Time out. You're making fun of her voice Vito, now. her voice. I heard it. I heard her tough. speak. It's tough, man. It's that why, It's just that voice that you go, ooh, and I don't know her personally and things like that, but her voice is really annoying. And I go, oh, man, I got to listen to seven more minutes of this. It's one of those voices that, like a Margaret Cho or somebody that just has that high-pitched nasally, ugh, I just didn't like her voice, and so I don't want to make anything political, but in the end, I think she failed in that she wasn't funny. I didn't laugh. I didn't chuckle. I didn't find anything um, really that offensive other than she was like, oh, you know, Sarah Huckabee, you know, Uncle Tom. It's like it wasn't funny. I think what you need to do is either cancel it if every time someone goes and performs, it comes up and, uh, you know, the comedians are just using it for attention. They're going to go hard to the paint because they know. Well, they're going to get a I never comedy heard the special. She'll yeah. get a comedy special, which she already had. But. Right. They're using it as a platform to make news. And that's not really what it's supposed to be for, but that's how everything turns, like we do with our television appearances, is just to market yourself and things like that. Oh, yeah. But in the end, I didn't laugh. I didn't find it funny. And for those that get offended, I think the best part of 
you and I is that we yell at each other, we fight, we argue, and I tell you, look, you do this, and you're like, no, I do this, and things like that. And then at the end of the day, we hug it out. We're we still laugh. friends. Yeah. And, and you still should be able to be friends, right? Yeah, you so, should still be able to laugh at each other and get along with each other. Yeah, so you can make fun of my appearance and calling me short as the only guy on television jumping for the sign, and I'm going, yeah, that's what I it made was. sure I made fun of you because it yes. happened. Yeah, we're going to be critical of each other because right. we state out facts, right? We're going to state out what is there. We're going to just lay it out there I in would, the open. I would welcome the opportunity. I could handle being roasted. Could you? Could you well, be handled? I think I could, too. I know they would talk about my appearance, my size, and everything, but you know what? I've heard stuff. I've dealt with stuff. I'm a man of extremely huge like mental toughness. I would say not to be like this guy that's being cocky now and to tout myself. But I think I have developed this, well, this tough interior and exterior where I can deal with a lot, deal with a lot of punches thrown my yeah. way. And the purpose of a roast is to hear some stuff that maybe is a little bit critical and harshly critical of you and maybe is a little bit offensive. Now, you know, some of the vulgarity stuff at times in these roasts, you know, I'm not a guy that's going to be cursing or maybe going that far if I were to roast somebody else. But it's to make fun of each other. It's meant in good fun and humor. And humor at times when there is a roast or in a roast setting, you're going to be making fun of others, right? Poking fun at them, maybe their appearance. It's how hard you go in the paint, right? How how far you go when you make fun of somebody's appearance because that can be crossed in the line at times, though, too. And maybe she did a little bit too much with right. Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Right. But still, you know what? Donald Trump, what is he doing on Twitter every single day? Making fun of everybody's appearance, too, that's not in his White House administration, not on his staff. So he makes fun of everybody on Twitter. So if the president of the United States is making fun of people, right, on Twitter, in his speeches, why can't... This comedian, she's a comedian. She's there for that purpose, to make fun of people and to roast others, including the people that work under Donald Trump, such as Sarah Huckabee Sanders, such as Kellyanne Conway. So guess what? If they're going to go, guess what? You have to deal with the punches, deal with the repercussions of it, and take it all in and with stride is what I'm trying to say. No doubt about it, Vito, but I guess I'll ask you, do you think they should continue the correspondence dinner? Should they get funnier people, or should they just say, look, let's do away with it? Donald Trump tweeted out and said, look, it's dying a slow death. It's well, not you funny. know, he's saying it because he can't take anything. He can't take right. any criticism. Should they continue it? Well, you know what? The thing is, too, really quick about Donald Trump. He hasn't attended the last two White House correspondence dinners since he's, you know, taken office. All the other presidents attended. So what does that tell you? And by the way, he's only done one press conference that's taken over as president. So what does that tell you about Donald Trump? He can't take criticism. He can't take jokes. He can't deal with any kind of criticism. So he doesn't have that tough, you know, interior. He doesn't have any of that. He doesn't have that tough exterior. He can't deal with anything because he's not mentally tough. He can't deal with the punches. And that's why he constantly tweets out stuff about others making fun of them because you know what? That's how he deals with them coming at him because he doesn't get it that sometimes when you're the president, you got to deal with criticism. you got to have that tough interior, that tough exterior, and deal with the punches. Vito, That's what I'm trying I to say. Vito, if you look at it from a different perspective, I feel like, you know, if you're Donald Trump, you're like, well, there's news stations dedicated to just talking about my every breath, my every Because word. he makes news every single day that are bombshells, so, right? So he's all like, look, you know, I'm a president, and if you look at CNN, it's presented in that he's 100% terrible, and they haven't talked about any of his successes in terms of the economy, in terms of the, the economy, fact that, which was good before, which was even and, better. And it's still good now. Yes, and still then you good look now at because the of the other guy side in office of it. before. Yes, and you look at the fact that North Korea was doing some things, and now there's some dialogue. That was beneficial, North Korea and South Korea, maybe forming a peace treaty and whatnot, and they All shook we're saying hands. Is, and, yeah. Donald Trump can say, look, I take it every single day, so why do I need to and have a should, every single president. Ha- and when you're making the critical mistakes that Donald Trump has, or really you're putting your foot in your mouth every single time he tweets out something or makes a statement. I mean, it looks like a buffoon out there at times when he takes a podium and he goes on Twitter. He's tweeting out like at 4 a.m. when he wakes up. It must be on the toilet or something and on his phone. Why are you, you know, tweeting out all that stuff? And it makes you, you look horrible, man. And no. you're the president and you look so stupid doing all this on Twitter Vito, is all I'm trying to say. You got to look at it from this perspective, okay? He's never, ever going to try to convince the left or liberals or Democrats. Oh, no, about it's all about his base. Right. All about his base, and that's so, it. I totally get that. It's still wrong what he's doing, though. It's still erroneous, in my opinion. He's going to no. keep doing it. He's not going to stop Vito. because of you or I talking, but he should. Peel back Curtailing the onion a little bit. bit. Peel back the onion a little bit and look at uh-huh. it like this, okay? He won the election tweeting. He won the election being Donald Trump. Okay, he built a, a base. Yep. He built Being a, a base. Yep. Yes, so he looks at it and goes, this is the formula, okay? If that's what it took, Vito, and we'd say, okay, John, you're going to get a million and a half downloads, this much money, 
for your tweets like this and that. But would you tweet out the vulgarities, the offensive yes. stuff? You would not be doing that. Yes, well, I then would. I would think different of you if you're going to do that. If you were to run for president, yeah, because nobody should do that if they're running for president. If I'm running 65 for anything. years old and I'm running for president and I start doing this and that, and then the reaction comes in and I go, okay. I'm invigorating people that are going to vote for me. I'm just going to tailor my thoughts to them. Okay. You know, you got to understand. And it all worked those, out for him. He won yeah, the election know, because of it. I get it. All those people that call him a buffoon, all those people Which that, is more and more people by the day. He doesn't have to. His own Republicans, the GOP, more uh, and more people from the GOP is doing it too. I would say if he ran today and, and there was an election, he'd uh, still be reelected. Because there's nobody good enough to run against him yes. to take him down. That's what it comes down to as well. That's Basically, why he won against Hillary. She now, wasn't good enough to win You can too. agree... Now, you can disagree with the measures of what he's doing, but in 10 years, when history writes a documentary about Donald Trump, and how much it'll of a say, he was? no, it'll say that he <laughs> found a way to uh, infiltrate a weak political system yeah, yeah, and as a lay business person walked in and won an election. And so they'll say, what did he do to win the election? He hammered social media and he hammered the media. And that's all he did, and that's all he's continuing to do. But all I would say is, you know what your opinion is of him now. All I would say is just look at his successes. The country's doing well. Um, we have more respect internationally. They're trying to work on the things that he's talking about. More respect internationally, less respect internationally. More, more. No, less. I know that's a fact. No, I think look it's it more. Up. Less. I think it's more. It is less. Look it's it more. up. Watch it's the news. Hey, if you watch CNN all the time, right? They it's would more. Tell you. And it's not just it's CNN. More. I know they're a little I bit biased, more. but they have some Republican people on there, too. But it's less. It's less. We'll agree to disagree. Mm. It's less. You think it's more, it's less. I would Trust say about the country. I would say it's more respect for the country. Maybe, yes, less respect for the man. But I think the country's doing well okay. where we're at right now. Okay. And so he's got a formula. He's sticking with it. And in the end, I know it sucks for those that are, don't believe in it. But oh, there is a he formula. doesn't care. He doesn't I care. wouldn't follow it. He doesn't care. And guess what, though? Him being the way he is on Twitter with what he says, his misogynist viewpoints. He doesn't a little care. bit of racism too expressed you with know. some of the stuff that he says. He doesn't care at all. Right. He's going to keep doing it, keep following the formula because he got elected. But I'm saying yes. for anybody else that it's a lay person like you or I to run for that office now, right. we could never get it. He's rooting right. it for every single person to follow him. That's my point, though, too. That's the documentary, what it's going to say. Ten years from now, the documentary is going to say, if Dwayne The Rock Johnson wanted to do it, maybe a better guy, better candidate, who knows? If he wanted to do it, guess what? He's not going to get elected now. Mm. Even Oprah maybe wouldn't. Now she has a great following. Maybe she would still get elected if she really ran. I'll disagree. I'm saying I don't think somebody could now. No, somebody you know, like Donald Trump would not get elected. Bigger we'll picture. See. Let's bigger, see. Ten bigger years from picture, now, we'll see. Bigger picture. The issue at hand is politicians have to find a way to connect with their followers. They and, do better. And they via do. social and media. True. And I do believe that uh, other lay people, because it's not been done in the past. Remember, Ronald Reagan was an actor. John F. Kennedy. Is but he a, had some political background before running for president. Yeah, of That's course, my point. Of course. He was an actor at first, but yeah. Of course. And now. He was what? Governor of California. You're going to see now potentially Peyton Manning, Tom Brady. You're going to see some influential. Running for local office. Of course. But winning local office is different than running for the presidency. Exactly. That's my point, too. Now, one issue that's affecting us here locally, mm -hmm. and it affects me significantly being an Eastsider, and for all of us Eastsiders is, man, I heard about it. You heard that 696 Westbound was going to be closed from 75 to 94. But Vito, when I tried, I was like, oh my gosh, you know what that means? You got to take a mile road. You know how much time that adds to a trip it if does. you're taking 10 mile all the way down or 11 mile all the way down from 75 to 94? It is a nightmare, and this is the first week it's happened. What has been your response? How have you heard it? People have messaged us on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. It's added link to the trip. they got to find alternative routes. they got a lot of headaches. It has jumbled up traffic, and guess what? It's no easy fix. I think it's a good six-month thing where they're shutting the entire westbound lane of 696 from I-75 to I-94. I was like, man. And that's the funny part is that highway is not that old. I was alive when they built it. You know, from the time... Really? So like 50 years ago? No, it wasn't no, I'm years ago. No, I'm, I'm joking. I, I think it was in the early 80s where that, that, that stretch of highway was built. 696 is not that old of an infrastructure of a highway, but now it's shut down. Has it affected you and any of your commute? For me, it's like, oh man, getting, not business-wise, but traveling, you know, when I go check out the rentals or when I go check out uh, family and friends down 696. The extra traffic for me, I would say, is when I go to Top Cat Sales because I take 696. So I can't now. Uh, I, I took 11 miles. I forgot about it. Listen to this. On Monday, I was driving into Top Cat in the afternoon, early afternoon, and I forgot. I forgot, actually, that 696 was closed down for me, and I had to, deal with, I had to take 11 miles all the way up until I got to, like, North Main Street and whatnot. But, yeah, 
So I had to deal with it because I go to Top Cat and I dealt with it for the first time on Monday of this past week. And like I said, I was so stupid. I should have known because I just had talked about it with my mom and dad. And they were giving me like alternate route options. I didn't listen to any of it. I guess good enough. Forgot about what they had said. And then I get into that pickle, I guess you could say that predicament, and just had to take 11 mile. So me being stupid and made me go. I mean, that took me another additional 10 to 15 minutes because I had to take uh, you know, drive them, you know, take the mile roads, take 11 mile there. And because of that, it added on some time for me with my commute to Top Cat, which luckily I'm not going in early in the morning or every single day. And imagine if you are taking, you know, you were taking 696 every single day for your work commute in the morning and coming back home. Think about that. It's already bad enough, right? Rush hour traffic on 696. But with it being closed down now, like what are the alternate routes you take? And if you have a long commute already, you know, imagine how much time that adds on to your commute and to your daily commute. So 696 West is what I have to get on. So for me, that's closed. 696 East actually is still open, which is nice for people. So like on my way home from Royal Oak, I'm able to take 696 East and I can still get home and not too bad of a fashion, like a timely fashion for the most part, maybe 30 minutes to 40 minutes it takes for me to get home. Yeah, yeah, for me, actually, being that 696 East is open, it's minimal effect because that's where I'm going usually is from uh, Sterling Heights into Roseville and things like that to a place like Guitar Center. So I'm actually kind of lucky for me in that it doesn't affect You have nothing to complain about at I'm all. I'm pretty what happy, right? I'm, uh, I'm a happy camper. You have all the reason in the world to be happy. Not only that, not going to affect you the construction there and 696 being closed down, but also a and as he on, puts you actually in the show. You didn't get cut out like you thought you would. So a exactly. lot of reasons to be positive but on this week's episode of Two Bad Hombres. 75,000 motorists use the westbound lanes every day, and they got to figure it out. And, oh, uh, yeah. You know, for me, I've kind of looked at it and said, man, mile roads do increase traffic. But for me, as of late, I definitely have been kind of avoiding highway traffic and things like that, getting around the city and things like that in terms of my travel. Obviously, going to Florida was just a one-way thing through the highways. But and what did you take? Tough. What highway did you take? Did you 75 start South. You take 94 to 75 okay. South all the way through. Mm-hmm. And the one thing you do recognize, though, is all this needs to be done. Michigan roads compared to Ohio, yeah. Tennessee, Ohio's beating us in Kentucky, that. We don't like to admit it at times, but Ohio Florida, is definitely beating us. And Michigan's a lot of roads are, are the worst. They are bad, man. All the bad. potholes. And I guess it's because of the inclement weather, the extreme weather changes. And because of that, you can't really control the roads and what they're going to look like. But now you have to invest more money in the city. Well, the state is, right? It has been putting more money, and it's been a long time coming, man, because it's not just 696 that needed work done. Think about all these roads, and like you said, some of these roads aren't even old, and they need the work done. So what does that tell you about the infrastructure, right, of Michigan and its roads? They just aren't in a good state, and it's going to take more and more money, more and more hard-earned taxpayer money, right, to cover these roads and the repairs. And this 696 West repair is going to take at least six months. Who knows? It could be even more. Could be almost a year-long recovery, you know, repair and recovery time for 696 West to be done and to be in proper shape, to be up to code how it should be and how it hasn't been for so long and and way too long, Doc, at this point. All right, Vito, we got to figure out a way to get these roads better. I don't know if people want to do tolls or they want to up their taxes, but uh, these highways are rough here in Michigan, and it just makes it tough in that, uh, luckily for me, this season, I survived pothole hell. So luckily, Did you? No incidents? No, no inc- flat tires? Gosh, Same thing for me. Good. Got a knock survive. on wood. You and I both, probably because we're two bad hombres and we're just great yes. podcasters. And we yes, bring sir. the heat every single week on two bad hombres. And maybe even though we get into a scuffle on air, we're still friends at the end of the day like you had said earlier too. And that's what we try to promote is the healthy way to have banter and disagree uh-huh. and look at things from a different perspective. You're always wrong and I'm always right. And mm-hmm. that's what, or the opposite. Exactly. Healthy dialogue exactly. right, is what that is too, I think. Always enjoy the conversation. I always look forward to the days we record. Thanks to Steve Dace for breaking down the Detroit Lions draft and giving us his thoughts on the Michigan Wolverines. Check it out. I'm definitely going to find it and find a way to post the A&E. Very superstitious under the category of sports. Vito and Doc. I told my wife, look, I'm not taking all my 15 minutes of fame, I, but I definitely took six you and a half. You gave some of it to me, too. Six and a half minutes I'm taking. Damn, that was awesome to be We made of. our TV debut. Did you ever imagine no, that you before. would be on TV? Oh, I've been on TV oh, before. Oh, time out. You've been on TV before, like for WWE or Raw. That's yes. right. In the and, background. And as or what else? in high school. Um, oh, if we're you remember, going back to high school now. High school days. Back in what, like 73 or something? 1995. No at the MDA Telethon, Amir Makeupson and Channel 50 used to kind of have these telethons late at night. Me and my high school raised three hundred dollars in pop can collections. Me and a buddy Joe went to the television station, and uh, I don't think I have the tape. It's buried deep in my tape collection. But <laughs> you have a lot of tapes. But 
It right, was no doubt. televised, me donating a check on behalf of East Detroit High School and my charitable philanthropic ways. I was chosen with Joe to go down late at night at like 11 o'clock and donate the check to Amir Makeups, and they showed me. Look and at you, he, Doc. So I've had my the share. He has been a, a charitable dude. I've been on television, and uh, going forward, every time I'm on television, I... Definitely feel the need to share it, so it's great. I was about to say, does it feel like it's no it big deal now old. at this point? No. Because now you've been on TV so much, you're like a TV star, like nothing doing a TV spot for you, huh? It's great, and so I like being on television, and so why not continue it? And definitely with Raw and things like that. So just follow us on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. Follow Vito on Twitter at Vito Jerome for all the continued fun, hijinks, and hilarity. We have fun with it. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but very superstitious. You and I, we made our television debut after a year. That's how television is. It took long enough, but they have to cut a lot out. I mean, they cut a lot of so what Vito, we were included in, too, so for Vito, that TV episode. Yes, think, sir. Thinking that, uh, you know, you've told me that, you know, let's do more videos, let's things like that. Now you're on television. I definitely will show up more on television. Maybe... I should continue to drop weight, put on a suit. Maybe I'll be a TV guy and try to get myself instead of now you're going to be taking my thunder. You know what? I'm, really? You know what? Maybe the next goal will be to get on television and have the Detroit Sports Podcast and host and become a big time reporter. Let's get on Channel Seven with Justin Rose to start off. Maybe Channel Seven Sports came on a Sunday. That's, That's a whole other enough. story. That's not good enough for you, Doc. That's a whole. I know story. Adam used to do some stuff with Justin. That was web video content. It was good. He That's a whole other it. story. Whole I, other story for another day, huh? Yeah, we'll definitely try and work that angle, but we'll see. We'll see if that happens. Maybe I'll become a t- TV star. Maybe I'll get the hair plugs or hair or something. Oh yeah, get some <laughs> fake hair, man. <laughs> All right, let's you get would out love of here. it. And you know what? Really quick too for Doc, like everything that he does to make him feel good too, because you know yes. he's hosting it. He wants to feel good. So you have to like it. You have to comment on it. At least pretend that you like it. Yes. You know, and say Thank that you. he looks good. His bald head looks really good. The shiny dome he has yep. on the top of his head. So to make him feel good. I mean, that's all you're looking for, right? And for me too, make me feel good by commenting on my stuff and uh, sharing our stuff on Facebook, yes. on Twitter at Vito Jerome, While like you said. We are giving thanks. I definitely want to give thanks to the most engaged social media follower that we got, your mother. I appreciate My it. My mom is always she on Facebook. She likes everything I post. She shares all the podcasts. She's definitely there quickly, too. So thank you to Vito's Almost mother. I appreciate it. too quickly. Maybe. What is she doing? She's at work? Maybe Elizabeth, not at work? Where is she really at? No. Thank you, Elizabeth. I definitely have noticed. I appreciate it. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Lizard, as in my madre. Adios now, guys.